And I want to send you home with some ideas about things that you can do pra practically um, with yourself, with your study group, with your lodge, any way you would like to um, apply this information. So um, today we have the path of cooperation in the spiritual life, the mind of the masters, and the ladder of lives. I should mention that I gave the program title before I decided that the ladder of lives was probably better described as a ladder of oneness. So the later slides you'll see reflect that change. So just a moment. There we go. So um, this very strangely titled group from 1926 from the Netherlands, Order of Service for the Defense of Theosophy and the TS, came up with a very interesting way of thinking about Theosophy and the Theosophical Society. And I want to present this to you because you are all going to go back to your home countries and your home study groups, study centers, and lodges. And you may encounter some resistance to what you have learned here from the older, more conservative, and sometimes even fundamental aspects of the Theosophical Society. So I want to give you a um, a way to present yourselves that is inviting them to consider another view. I don't want to call this a weapon, but uh, something that you can use as a kind of shield and protection and support for yourself and for other people who think as you do. So this is what they said. Only that insight which each of us has been able to experience as truth for ourselves and from within ourselves can be called theosophy. Information from others can never form the basis or essence of the theosophical conception of life, but at the most ought to be considered as a help or encouragement to the search of truth. So that leads to a question, what is theosophy then? For me, I think of it as the synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy, which, as you will recognize, is the subtitle of Madame Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine. And I would like to emphasize that each of us create our own synthesis on our journey back to oneness with source. Oneness with source, or journey back, that's the way I describe some things that have fancier Sanskrit terms, maybe in The Secret Doctrine, but I think it makes the point. We are all fragments of this larger, I call it source consciousness. In a sense, we've been split off from that and we've been assigned the task of evolving back to oneness with it. So as we create this synthesis, we do it in several ways. One of them is it becomes our belief system during any given lifetime. But it also, whenever we master any idea, any wisdom, any concept, it becomes the matrix of who we are after we've lived from such beliefs in a particular lifetime. So in other words, we take these syntheses with us when we die. It gets built into our bodies, mental, spiritual bodies, and then shows up in some way in our next lifetime and becomes um, a way for us to orient ourselves in the world and also a trigger of what I called self-remembering earlier, where a book or a teacher or a conversation or a movie or a television show suddenly taps you into this body of knowledge that you're already carrying. So with these ideas in mind, let's take a look at the purpose of the Theosophical Society. In my opinion, the purpose is to provide a safe container within which people can gather materials for, incubate, or self-remember their own syntheses of science, religion, and philosophy. So we have a container. It's not always a safe container. There are lots of people who want you to accept their version of theosophy because they have an idea that it's the one and only version. And yet, each of us is making our own synthesis. These people also made their own synthesis. And we need to stand up for our right, our fundamental right, 
as a human being and within the Theosophical Society to maintain independence of thought and belief in any area where we feel that's needed. And then in our relationship with the outside world, we have to consider that we are merely guides to theosophical content, facilitators of understanding, teachers by example in thought, feeling, and action. I probably should have added speech there, thought, feeling, speech, and action. What we say about theosophy should always be framed as an invitation to consider our personal synthesis. So when you go home, this is what I've presented to you. You make your own synthesis of it. As you speak about it to others, you can invite them to consider that synthesis. I think this is the most helpful way to prevent everyone going home and saying, well, Kurt Leland says, and then making some emphasized point as if I have any authority in this matter. As I said, isn't always an invitation for a personal synth synthesis. If you agree with something I've said, if it's helpful for you, you can invite someone else to consider that it might be helpful for them too. Okay, so what I intend to do this morning is I'm going to talk about the mind of the masters again, as I did at the beginning and also once in the middle. I'm also going to point out some practices that we can take home with us to work with um, on our own or in a group. And the first one um, has to do with developing the mind of the masters. Now, I want you to consider that I have been, to the best of my ability, living from my idea of any Besson's statement about the mind of the masters. You've seen it in action all week. It's been in the form of showing up for you for the lectures. It's in the form of all the work I did to prepare the lectures. It's in the form of what I've offered to you and answers to your questions. Um, many questions were asked outside of our lecture hall. Every time I walked somewhere, it seemed someone showed up with a question. I always tried to show up for them in whatever way that I could. So um, please don't tell people that I think I'm a master, but I do use the idea of the mind of the masters as a guide for my whole life. I live it, I teach it, I show it to you, I demonstrate it, and I hope that you will recognize the benefit that that can have for people. So here again is what Annie Besant Bess said about the mind of the masters. The consciousness of the masters stretches itself out in any direction in which they send it, assimilates itself with any point to which they direct it, knows anything which they will to know, and all this in order that they may help perfectly, that there may be nothing that they cannot feel, nothing that they cannot foster, nothing that they cannot strengthen, nothing that they cannot aid in its evolution. To them, the whole world is one vast evolving whole, and their place in it is that of helpers of evolution. They are able to identify themselves with any step and at that step to give the aid that is needed. Again, that's from man and his bodies. Now, probably the area in which I most tried to demonstrate this in my own life was when people asked me a question. What I tried to do was listen inwardly. That's not exactly clairvoyance, but maybe it's related. So that no matter how clearly or unclearly the question was asked, no matter what the individual's proficiency in English was, I was able to reach in and pull out the core of the question and then respond to that. I think you've seen this demonstrated often enough, and I, I'm saying it not as a self-advertisement, but as an advertisement for the way of being that I talked about earlier, which is we're in this unity consciousness field that we call planet Earth. If we think of being in that field as responsiveness to needs of other beings and finding the best way to meet them. We're honoring what Annie Besant has to say about the mind of the masters. We're also developing a certain kind of psychic or clairvoyant ability. And it takes deep listening, deep inner listening to reach in and find the core of someone's question. So even that can become a spiritual practice for people. 
So now I want to remind you of what I call the basic spiritual practice because it's also the basis of the following one. And my idea is we should do this practice daily to develop buddhi, which is, as I mentioned before, the perception and realization of unity consciousness within ourselves. Show up, be fully present, be kind to yourself and others, and find a step to take in mutual joy. Let me go back to that slide a moment. Um, it's four simple points translated into your own language. It shouldn't be that difficult to do. And remind yourself of it. I'm surprised at the number of times people that I know get themselves tied up in all kinds of questions. And I remind them of this, and they settle down and start going forward with whatever they need to do. So the intermediate practice that I want to suggest is climbing the ladder of oneness. I've referred to this in various ways throughout the week. This set of slides is uh, specifically designed to support people in considering climbing the ladder of oneness as a possible spiritual practice. So how do we do this? We climb the ladder of oneness by applying the basic practice from a previous slide to each of these levels. We apply it to things. That's probably the closest most of us will get to the mineral world. If we take care of our things, if we honor their presence, if we're grateful for their uh, existence in our lives, they last longer and devas or nature spirits come in and help them last longer. House plants or a garden help us be responsive to the ladder of oneness at the vegetable kingdom level. We've talked about that. The so-called green, green thumb, or as it's called in the Netherlands, green fingers. The ability to um, naturally encourage the plant, uh, plants to grow. We've talked about it in terms of knowing what they need, being aware of when they need water, not just watering them once a week, but when they actually need it. Those are also ways of responding to the needs of other beings and developing that <coughs> sensitivity. Um, going up to the animal kingdom, wild butterflies and birds, there are simple things we can do in our gardens to create them as attractive and safe places for such beings. Um, bees also, fundamental um, elements of what supports the health of and well-being of the vegetable kingdom and allows us to continue harvesting the fruits and crops that we need. Household pets, we can use them also as a way of learning how to be responsive to the needs of other beings non-verbally. Farm creatures, if we happen to have uh, work to do with horses and sheep and cows and so on. And then we have a vast field of action with respect to the human kingdom, all ages of people from infants to the elderly. I mentioned the idea of I see the divine in you as a way of um, furthering or deepening that practice, the four steps that I mentioned earlier as the basic spiritual practice. It's really helpful to remind yourself that no matter how old someone is in terms of body or soul, they have this divine spark in them. There's another practice that I didn't mention, which I think is also very useful. As you know, the world is very reactive, and it's very polarized, and people tend to be reactive, and the media tend to encourage that because it's one of the ways of um, getting people to keep coming back. So how do we battle this? As a personal practice, the way that I battle it is I remind myself with a phrase that's practically a mantra, that's just information. In a sense, the mind always has to react. If you give it a completely neutral reaction like that, the mind stays calm. Now, think of how this would apply in a personal situation. Somebody's upset about something and they're blaming you. And you want to get upset at them because they're blaming you. But you could think to yourself, this is just information. This is information about how I'm perceived. This is information about everything that happened in this person's life before this moment that is showing up right now. 
This is just information about whether or not there's something I need to do. You see what I mean? It, it's completely neutral, it's open-ended, it doesn't get you locked into a like or a dislike or a hate or a love-based reaction, an attraction, a repulsion, the things I talked about with respect to the ethics lecture a couple days ago. And then you can show that you are ready to climb the ladder of oneness within the Deva Kingdom by feeling joy and gratitude for things such as the elementals that maintain the health of our body, feelings, mind, and soul. Those are the, um, the body elementals that I spoke about yesterday. The beings of the stones, trees, rivers, lakes, winds, clouds, colors, light, landscapes, in other words, the nature spirits and devas of the elements. The way that I arrange that is with reference to the earth element, stones, the water and earth element together, trees, the water element, rivers, lakes, the air element, winds and clouds. We don't think of the fire element in terms of anything but a flame, but actually light is an expression of the color of the uh, fire element, and the fact that we can see colors is one of the manifestations of that. So if we're out in the landscape, we can actually be grateful in every moment for everything that we see if we keep in mind that there are manifestations of those four elements. And devas are very receptive to that way of looking at things. And feeling joy and gratitude for the support that we receive in research and creative work, the inspiration devas and the information seeking devas that I mentioned. So we have to know that when, when that we have to know that when we are ready, whatever training we need to see, hear, and understand invisible beings to communicate and collaborate with them or fulfill a task or mission for them, it will develop naturally and organically. As they begin to show up for us, be fully present with us, be kind to themselves and us, and find a step to take in joy with us. So those are the four elements of the basic spiritual practice. The idea is as we do it to others, other levels of being do it back to us, including the deva level. So, deceased humans, same thing applies, and masters and inner teachers can also start to treat you in this way. So this brings us to a more advanced spiritual practice. This is the master's part of the, the morning's talk. What do we do about invisible teachers? So here's what Annie Besson had to say about the invisible teachers or masters. They are human beings who have perfected themselves and have nothing more to learn on earth, who live in physical bodies on earth for the helping of humanity, who take pupils that desire to evolve more rapidly in order to serve humanity and are willing to forsake all for this purpose. That's from Annie Besson's book, The Masters, from 1912. And then she has this to say about attracting such teachers. When people, by their own efforts, utilizing to the full all the general help coming to them through religion and philosophy, isn't that our second object, comparative study of science, religion, and theosophy? When these people have struggled onwards to the front of the advancing human wave, and when they show a loving, selfless, helpful nature, isn't that our first object, universal brotherhood? Then these people become a special object of attention to the watchful guardians of humanity, the masters. And opportunities are put in their way to test their strength and call forth their intuition. And there is our third object, developing the latent powers in humanity. Once again, for all of those um, who are struggling in, in your study groups and lodges around the idea of whether the third object has any importance, I think it's absolutely fundamental to what it means to be a theosophist. So again, I'm, I'm hoping you'll be able to carry this message out and create somewhat more openness to that object, which has been so neglected. As I said um, yes, in yesterday's talk with Tim, the Theosophical Society was meant to have three legs and we've been limping along with only two. And that comes from Annie Besson's The Ancient Wisdom.
from 1897. So here's what Blavatsky herself had to say on this subject the subject of spiritual unfoldment as opposed to psychic development. This comes from um, a, something that she wrote called the Preliminary Memorandum. Um, this was the basis of what she created as the Esoteric School of Theosophy. You can find it in the collected writings. The citation is at the end of this set of slides. It also has been republished in Michael Gomes' Um, fairly recent edition of the Esoteric Instructions, and it can be find in, found in a, um, another pamphlet called The Original Program of the Theosophical Society. The prelim preliminary memorandum is in there. So she said this, as I summarize it. First you have to establish the belief in the existence of the masters or invisible teachers. You learn to understand their nature and their powers. That usually requires some, some reading in theosophical literature. And perhaps you come to reverence them in your heart. You tr attempt to draw near to them as much as you can. That might seem obscure, but if you consider what Annie Besant said about the mind of the masters, if you adopt that as your practice, that's probably the very best way to come near to them. And then you open yourself up for conscious communication with them, especially one to whom you might dedicate your life. So I'm going to talk about this last one in two respects. The first one is the idea of conscious communication, and the second one is the idea of dedication. Remember, I talked about the dedicated life yesterday, so this is another movement in that direction. Now, surprisingly enough, Blavatsky had something to ch say about channeling that is actually positive, regardless of the people in the Theosophical Society that have been saying for decades that she thought it was wrong. Subjective, purely spiritual, quote-unquote, mediumship is the only harmless kind and is often an elevating gift that might be cultivated by everyone. That comes from the note at the end of something that she published. It's been completely overlooked. I think it's very important for us to consider it. When she says subjective, what she means is not the objective mediumship that creates impressive changes in physical reality, as in the seance room when tables flew in the air and, and trumpets played themselves and things like that. As far as Blavatsky was concerned, that was potentially harmful. And what she also means by purely spiritual mediumship is that you're not trying to get in touch with people who have died. Purely spiritual means that you're trying to open yourself up to higher levels of being. And from my perspective, the best way to do that is to sit down with a journal in hand, to ask a question about some aspect of your personal or spiritual life, then to sit in meditation, listen inwardly, and start writing. In the beginning, you'll write something that you know. But if you keep writing, say if you time yourself for 15 or 20 minutes, towards the end you'll start feeling a kind of energetic support that helps you write something you didn't know that you could actually act on. So that's a kind of practice that brings us closer to invisible teachers. The other thing that's helpful are the two questions that I mentioned in yesterday's meditation. Simple open-ended questions, what do I need to know right now? What do I need to do with what I know? Those questions can also be useful if you sit down with your journal and make the experiment of inner listening and writing what's present for you. Can you repeat those two questions? I'm sorry. What do I need to know right now? And what do I need to do with what I know? In other words, information that is supportive in some way and possibly directive, but then what's a step I can take to make it real? Gosh, they're already on the slide. What do you know? Well. <laughs> <laughs> so the second part of the earlier slide had to do with a master or an invisible teacher that you could dedicate your life to. There are specific masters assigned to specific areas of life. If you know about the seven rays, 
um, th there are different, let's call them uh, frequency bands of energy that we can respond to. From my perspective, they also represent a path that we can take back to the source, and they're fairly well known. The translations I use are listed here. For the first, gray, will and power. For the second, love and wisdom. For the third, adaptability or tact. For the fourth, beauty and harmony. For the fifth, science, in other words, detailed knowledge, information. For the sixth, devotion. For the seventh, this somewhat obscure phrase, ordered service, what was meant there was ritual. You can think of it as ceremonial magic, but what it really is, is cooperative work with devas, which is probably the least scary way of telling someone what you're doing. Of course, they might ask what a deva is, but at least it's not a devil, right? So, I found this um, diagram in a magazine from the 1920s, and it's the basis of organization for a group called the Theosophical Order of Service. This group exists in many countries throughout the world. You are all members of it, even if you don't know it, even if you've never heard of it. Anybody who is a member of the Theosophical Society is also a member of the Theosophical Order of Service. This was established in 1908 by Annie Besant. The idea was that the Theosophical Society itself had to maintain neutrality. It could not tell you to go out and do work in the world. But there were people who wanted to do work in the world. So she created this second organization to support people in doing that. Now, the, uh, the organization is often involved in various kinds of humanitarian work, but there was an American theosophist named Max Wardall who became the head of it in the 1920s, and he arranged this diagram according to the seven rays. So we've got social service, which is the will and power, and then a list of different things that can be done there. Animal welfare, which is love and wisdom. World peace, which is uh, the adaptability and tact. Diplomacy, in other words. This one is a little obscure. I'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, back to nature, that has to do with scientific ways of supporting um, self-care for our health. And, and then sixth, healing is one expression of the devotional ray. And then arts and crafts as ceremonial magic, isn't that a revolutionary thought? But if we know that the arts are ways that we can um, communicate with and collaborate with devas, it makes perfect sense. So now what about this watcher? The, um, the fourth ray is ordinarily talked about as the ray of harmony and beauty and is assumed to be connected with artistic expression. What was intended here was that there would be a department of the Theosophical Order of Service that would be constantly looking out in the world for opportunities for service or pay attention to what the groups were doing and eventually publish it in a newsletter which was called The Watcher. Obviously that's not relevant now, but I want to make a point that I think is important for all of us going forward and that is within each of our groups, within each of our study centers or lodges, there's probably a library some aspect of that library may um, involve journals, especially old journals from the Theosophical Society. I find an endless amount of interesting material by going through those journals. I go to the headquarters of the Theosophical Society in America. Many of them are online as well. And so not only for my programs, but also for my personal practice, also for experimenting with my groups to see if I can take a theosophical concept and create some kind of practice for it that people find beneficial. Um, and a thing like this chart can show up and show us ways in which we have forgotten our tradition or forgotten ideas that were actually really helpful. In this case, I don't know that the purpose is to reconstruct the theosophical order of service along these lines, but in terms of dedicating ourselves to a master or a department of life in service, I think this is a pretty good guide or set of suggestions if you just adapt it to present circumstances. So let's think about seven rays in this form. So this is the slide where you can 
jump off from that chart and start thinking about how you might be able to make use of it yourself. So social reform coming in the will and power area, welfare of all beings in the love and wisdom area, will peace in the adaptability and tact area, arts and crafts or beauty and harmony in the uh, fourth area, the one that was called the watcher, natural living, self-care, science, um, in the sense of What's the best way to nourish ourselves? What kind of exercise do we need? How can we promote a healthy relationship with the outdoors? And things of this nature. Isn't it fascinating that the Theosophical Society in the 1920s was talking about natural living? I've heard a rumor that Max Wardall and his wife were nudists. So, that, I mean, that was an interesting movement that was going on back then. I don't know whether we need to sign up for that or not, but some people might consider that a version of natural living, and you know, why not, as long as you don't get a sunburn, right? <laughs> so, um, healing comes under the devotional head, and then, as I mentioned earlier, not so much arts and crafts per se, but cooperative work with Deva's so-called magic, that comes under the seventh head. So, continuing with what with what Blavatsky said about spiritual unfoldment. We have to rise to the plane where the masters are without attempting to draw them down to ours. What that means is meditation, essentially. Learning how to hang out at higher levels of being so that the contact can be established. Probably we'll have to do a certain amount of work on calming down our lower bodies, physical sensations, emotional reactions to things, likes and dislikes. And that's where the ideas of so-called purity come into the theosophical teachings. A book I would recommend looking into um, along these lines is, if I can bring, bring it back, <coughs> is, let's see, is it The Laws, Laws of the Higher Life? I think that's the title of it, The Laws of the Higher Life. Kenny Besson again. So, again, we rise when we practice unity consciousness, and we rise when we adopt the mind of the masters, as I've described it several times. And then HPB says, know that help, instruction, and enlightenment will be given when deserved. We don't decide when we deserve it. But when we show up to be in service for others, there may be ways in which opening some spiritual power to understand the needs that are involved and know how to respond to them that can show up for us to help us know how to take a step. And as I mentioned, the preliminary man, uh, memorandum, if you have access to the collected writings, you can find that. The, uh, the two others that I mentioned are both currently in print from Theosophical Publishing House, Michael Gold's edition of the Esoteric Instructions, and the original program of the Theosophical Society. But if we're going to talk about uh, some kind of communication with the masters, some kind of support or inspiration or teaching from invisible teachers, we need to think about how to discern the difference between messages from lower and higher beings. And this is what Annie Besant had to say in summary. A personal wish reflected back by the desire-based forces of the astral plane brings what she calls impatience, hurry, excitement, <coughs> and anger if the carrying out is opposed. So this is how we know that we're involved with personal wishes. If we're having reactions, it can't be from the master. Um, I would say impatience, hurry, excitement, and anger aren't the only ones that we can have. There can be a communication and we wonder whether we deserve it, or we wonder whether we can do it, or it feels like it's too much for us. Um, those are all ways in which the personality can tend to interfere with connection with the masters. And if we look at it, it's usually about selfishness. In the case of what's described here, it's the selfishness of, I am more important than everybody else, and you are not letting me do what the masters told me to do. Um, in the case of the other one, it's, I have no value. You know, um, why are you, th I, I don't feel worthy of what you're telling me to do. But isn't that really a, Please feel sorry for me, Mr. Master, and you know, take care of me somehow or rescue me from the horrible situation of my life that I created for myself. 
So the spiritual impulse from higher beings, again according to Annie Besson, including the masters, brings what she says, utter absence of excitement and passion of any kind, and a sense of devotion, calm, and patience. So um, those are some helpful guidelines about contact with masters and invisible teachers. That comes from um, my anthology of Annie Besson's writings called Invisible Worlds. So in the T.S. Adyar tradition, there are various stages on the path. We're coming to the end of my, uh, my talk and my program, and since the title of the program was The Path of Cooperation in the Spiritual Life, let's think about the stages on the path that's talked about in our theosophical teachings. This slide is intended to be a set of references that you can look up if you want to go deeper in your studies. First, there is a preparatory period called coming to the path. You can read about that in In the Outer Court by Annie Besson and Invisible Helpers by C.W. Leadbeater. Then comes the so-called probationary path. A master or an initiate or some higher being has seen that you are ready to be of service, that you already are of service, that you might be, that you might benefit from some support. And in order to prepare yourself for that kind of support, there's a set of qualifications to look for, and Annie Besson's book, The Path of Discipleship, is a good resource for the probationary path. <coughs> then there's what's called the path proper. These are the famous, famous initiations. You can learn about these in The Masters by Annie Besson in a very short form and in a very technical form, The Masters and the Path by the Peter. Something that is not commonly known about The Masters and the Path, which was published in the late 1920s, is that it is actually material from the esoteric school of theosophy. Much of it was delivered in the 1890s, and it was thought that it was time to bring this out to the public in support of the coming of the world teacher. We're blessed for that because the teachings of the esoteric school are otherwise completely unavailable. But one of the reasons why the book is a bit of a challenge is, is that it is written for advanced theosophists. Um, the original and probably still qualification for joining the esoteric school was that you were already a member of the, of the Theosophical Society for two years. So by that time you've got enough of a basis where you can understand this kind of technical material. And then beyond the path proper, the usual five initiations, there's something that Leadbeater calls the official period. And what this means is that you've become a member of the occult hierarchy. And there are several initiations beyond that, actually five more, going all the way up to Lord of the World. Um, I don't think any of us really have that aspiration. But I also think that this idea of initiations is somewhat dangerous. Um, there was an American man, I think a very advanced soul, by the name of Joshua David Stone. He had took theosophical material and tried to update it, and he called it Ascension. So sometimes you'll see New Age books about Ascension. It's, it's really a repackaging of theosophy. But he decided that he was going through the initiations and eventually he got to the level of believing that he was the Lord of the world and then he committed suicide because he thought that he could be of more benefit to humanity on the other side than on this side. So we have to be careful about these teachings that they don't inspire in us unhealthy ambitions. And once again, I think Annie Besson's idea of the mind of the master will prevent that because Nothing about the phrases that I read out to you today and previously has anything to do with power over. It's always power under. That is support. So think about that when you are going forward with your spiritual path. If spiritual powers come to you, it's always for power under, not power over. And then I'm going to include a bonus practice which has to do with the Angels of the Four Corners that I've talked about here. I'm not going to go into it now. I will have, as a part of this particular program, there's a whole set of instructions. Um, you can also go to the um, 
the video that's on the YouTube channel for the ITC. I've included those links in another slide, as you might recall. I just want to show you what the diagram looks like for the Angels of the Four Corners. So, the basis of this is the directions, and each direction represents something. So east is source, west is self, in the sense of our best selves. North is what I call the, the path of identity. That's the path of developing who we are, our um, true or core self, our function in the universe. And then the path of union is in the south. So these are my words for the, in, the path of involution, where we develop our identity, and the path back to source where we develop our sense of union. So when the angels announced their presence to me at Cretona, all I saw was that there was a power angel in that corner, a beauty angel in that corner. You can have to imagine a meditation hall like this in which I had this experience. Um, uh, love in that corner and truth in that corner. But much later I realized that uh, when, I, when I was given these senses of uh, these indications of what the directions meant, that power is actually personal identity plus the energy of the source. That beauty is the light of the source plus the experience of union. Love is the experience of union as it occurs in the individual self. And truth is the self uh, connected with our identity, if you think of identity as being our dharma in the world. So the basis of the practice is we work with mantras with each of these angels, then we create cross links between them, and then we request the presence of what I'm calling for one of a better word, the great mother angel. So you might remember a slide from yesterday was of the world mother. That's essentially what's meant here. Um, the world mother as Jeffrey Hodson perceived her was something like Mother Mary in the Catholic Church, but more of an angelic expression of that. Um, you can use any imagery that you like, but uh, the, the idea of the Great Mother in Hinduism or in some versions of Paganism or Wicca is essentially what's meant. Personally, I call this the Subtle Alignment Deva, because this being permeates everything about the universe, but unless we're directed towards unity consciousness, which is a very subtle realignment of our inner being. We have no awareness of our connection with this subtle alignment deva. And then I have a version of this that I do in theosophical settings, where various so-called theosophical worthies are placed in the corners. So. Master M is a master of the first ray, which is the power ray, goes in this corner. Master KH, as a, uh, a second ray master, goes in the corner of love and is related to love wisdom. Because of their pursuit of tru truth, I put Blavatsky and Annie Besson in this corner. Um, CJ is C. Jinaraja Dasa. He's one of the very, of the very few uh, famous early Theosophical writers and also uh, fourth president of the Theosophical Society who deals extensively with the arts and creativity. And then Rukmini was the wife of the third international president, George Arendale. She also was very involved with the arts because of her training in Indian dance and her involvement with the ITC. Then there is a kind of guardian deva for the TS that comes in in the middle. And I put Leadbeater as a sort of master of ceremonies in the center. So when I go work at a theosophical organization, this is the template that I use to get an idea of how the energies are operating on the campus and whether any of the angels feel neglected um, or need some extra support, or they would like for us to be more involved with them. They'll talk to me about that. At the Theosophical Society in America, I've talked to Barbara, who's the outgoing president, about this. Um, I've done this work in the meditation room. It used to be that the workers would join there every morning for about a 20-minute meditation. That was before the pandemic came. And what I often found was 
Lots of people love to sit in the truth corner. A few people like to sit in the power corner. Almost no one was ever in the beauty corner. And there was usually one person in the love corner, thank God. And I think that's kind of the energy, and you might even say kind of the karma of the Theosophical Society. You know, we're all really about truth. Some of us are somewhat or really about power. We forget about the arts, and um, luckily we often attract someone, at least one person, in the, among the resident workers that comes from the heart. So ideally, the organization should be balanced in all four ways. And the hardest one seems to be the beauty. For some reason, again, you know, it may be a reflection of mystics. Beauty isn't truth. I mean, John Keats said that truth was beauty and beauty was truth. So I think they're more or less um, equivalent. That's the great early 19th century British poet. So, um, but I think of beauty as the light of the source shining through a person or a place or a thing that's been created. And if we don't remind people that beauty exists as a path to the source, the world gets more and more material, more and more scientific, the devas get less and less interested. Wherever the devas are connected, there's magic. If they leave, the world literally gets harder and harder for us to live in year by year. So, that completes my talk with this lovely picture, many of you may have seen it, done in the 1890s by a theosophist, a British theosophist named Reginald McKell. And what I love about this picture is it really is a summary of everything we've been talking about this week. The Deva, for example, is embracing all of humanity in this path. We have masters, we have an initiate or someone on the quest, we have beings that need to be um, taken care of, making offerings here, needing service here. Um, so everything we've been talking about this week is contained there. So as I mentioned, you will all get PDFs of the programs, um, a color version for viewing on screen, and a black and white version for printing if you want to distribute it to other people. If you, several people have said they may do a presentation about this for their study group. Um, the links that I've mentioned will be included, the instructions for the uh, Angels of the Four Corners practice, and how to do it for an altar, or for a meditation room, or for some room in your house, like a bedroom, for the whole house or the whole apartment, for an office. In other words, all of these are, are places that you can w interact with and learn to work with these angels. So, thank you very much for your attention. So, the problem with the idea of development of psychic or spiritual powers is that it's will-based. and the devas tend, and the invisible teachers tend not to respond so well to that. Um, any form of education about what's involved can be useful. In several of the programs, I actually outline a set of steps. Um, those steps are not just steps for um, working with angels or working with invisible teachers or working with people who've passed on. It's a template that you can take into any area of life. So, at the beginning, you simply state an intention. That's harmless. Um, if you stated the intention of, I want to be perfectly enlightened immediately to be of service to the world, and the devas took you seriously, there wouldn't be much left of you after 24 hours. <laughs> so, um, the idea is to invite some kind of connection, and then be open to when it shows up. Continue to prepare yourself. Think about the ladder of lives. Any form of thinking or meditating or trying to align life with some of these ideas, like the mind of the master, it all creates a readiness, an opening. If anything blocks it, 
something will show up as a lesson that you need to learn. Certainly we've heard stories like that in our In the Twilight experience. I believe this is the very best way to, to develop ourselves or, or unfold ourselves organically. The only thing I think that is of any danger in, in any of this, well, maybe two things. One of them I've already spoken about, it's mistaking guidance from a lower and unreliable level for guidance from a higher level. Even that is not inherently harmful as long as you don't immediately take action on whatever, you know, as long as you live with it and feel it and instead of rushing into it. Um, if it seems doubtful, check it out with somebody. Um, you know, if any of you go home and, and a voice tells you you have to leave your family and quit your job and work in the Theosophical Society for the change of the world and you're not sure whether it's okay, write me about it. You know, you'll have my email address. I won't tell you no, but I probably won't tell you yes either. But the thing is, we have to develop a, a, an approach of discernment for things like this. Um, if we're too enthusiastic, we may be getting into something that isn't good for us. And that applies to just about any area of life. Having, having a mentor who can say, maybe, let's think about this, let's not rush into this, um, let's do a little more study before we say yes, that can be helpful. And I don't mind being that mentor if you don't mind hearing that from an older person. <laughs> um, so anyway, keep in mind that template. I gave it in outline form very specifically in one of the earlier lectures and then I applied it several times and that was meant to be a demonstration of how you can use it. So you could say that what I've tried to do here is encapsulate one version of the dedicated life. It may be for you, it may not, may not be for you. It may reflect your um, psychic or spiritual temperament, or it may not. There may be elements of it that you want to add to your personal synthesis about what theosophy means, or maybe not. The only other thing you have to be cautious about is in working with devas, I mentioned this earlier, when you request their presence, be grateful, when you're done, be clear that you're done. Be grateful for their support, say goodbye. If you need to imagine that you're closing the door in your mind, that can be helpful. Um, along these lines, there was a, a, an elderly spiritualist lady in England that I saw a little um, film clip about some years ago. She said, when I'm wearing my hat, I'm open and the spirits are welcome to come. When I'm not wearing my hat, I am not open, and they are not to come under any circumstances, and I will tell them to go away if they do. There's a lot of wisdom in that. We have to um, develop safety when we're working with these other worlds so that we're not overwhelmed by the information and can't function in the real world. So even a simple quote-unquote ritual, like having a hat, or it could be a necklace, or a bracelet or something like that that's connected with when you're open and when you're not can be a useful way of maintaining safety. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to just tell another story about um, some students of mine. This happened before I met them. Um, they were very close to women friends, best friends and they had a dream about each other. And one of them had the dream that they were driving in a car and the other person was sitting by the side of the road and the car passed them. And the other one had the dream of sitting by the side of the road with the other person in the car passing them. So it's like they not only shared the same dream, but they had their you know, alternative perspectives on it. So this is definitely you know, something that, that can happen to people who are really um, spiritually close to each other. Okay, so um, night class. It is my belief that many of us may be involved with something like that. Um, it is a kind of realization of everything I've been talking about in terms of getting in touch with or being trained by invisible teachers. 
And um, the only qualification for night class is being able to get there. That's the first one, I guess I could say. The second one is being able to remember it when you get back. And um, what you learn there, it comes in the form of energy. Um, you have to unpack it. Uh, you may have to learn how this language of feel thing that I talked about to get more. Usually, um, it's taught by somebody who might correspond to the level of initiate in the theosophical teachings. I call a person who does that a facilitator because it's a very neutral term. Their real function is simply to facilitate the growth of other people. Um, there is a kind of hierarchy that I've experienced. Facilitators are the lowest level. Then there are administrators who work with the facilitators in coordinating their activities. And then there are overseers who are involved with the overall planning and evolution for the planet. Um, I've been in classes like that. Uh, some, some of them are very basic, like I would call it dream class. And lots of people who don't have a, a very deeply developed spiritual life go there just to learn how to deal with business issues or relationship issues. The usual sign that they're involved in something like that is they dream that they're watching a movie or a play. And that's how they're educated. If you become more <coughs> conscious, um, probably you will discover at some point um, that you're on the mental level of being in a class like this. Um, there are special points in each plane. Alice Bailey called them ashrams for workers. And I think that's kind of a higher level of, de of uh, experience than a night class. Going to the ashram, you have the opportunity to rest, to recharge, to be with others of your kind, people who are actively involved in work as an invisible helper, um, to receive training and to receive tasks or missions. And I remember sometimes when I visited that place, it's, it's not unlike what we've created here in the course of this week. Um, except that everyone there is in a spiritual body and interacting with each other as their whole self instead of the way most of us are where we just have pieces that are well developed and other pieces we're still trying to integrate. Um, I recommend that sometimes the people who have a lot of ability to dream or astral project that they suggest to themselves or aim for the ashram because if you can get there and you're awake, you'll get um, much more solid, useful training. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you.